Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome each and every one of you to Second Avenue Methodist Church for worship. This morning we're doing something a little bit different, and I'm encouraging all of you to wear a mask. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Cokesbury Hymnal 297, which is a call to worship. 297. It's in the back of your book. 297. As you are turning, I uh, want you to know that there is a um, district-wide youth gathering this afternoon at Trinity. Invite all our youth to go there. And the Bible study is happening this Thursday via Zoom. We are doing Sandra Richter Psalms. It's an awesome curriculum. And invite all of you to join us on Zoom. Those of you who would like to come in person, you're welcome to do that to Fellowship Hall Thursday at 6 o'clock. Let us gather ourselves for worship. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let us worship God. and a dealer in purple cloth. 
the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Beautiful word, wonderful word, word of life. That is who you are. And we pray, Lord, that you would come to us as the word is being proclaimed, that you would teach us faith and duty. Lord, may all the words of my mouth and all the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you You are indeed our rock, our savior, and our redeemer. In your holy and precious name, we pray, amen. Those of you who are new, and those of you who've been out for a while, we are still celebrating the summer as a camp meeting style worship, and we are in a sermon series in the book of Acts. In chapter 1a, Jesus told his disciples that they would be witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and finally to the ends of the earth. 
And what that meant back in those days was to Gentiles. In chapter 10, the gospel breaks through the Gentile barrier after Peter receives the vision that he is to preach the gospel to Gentiles, especially to Cornelius and his household. This is a groundbreaking work through Peter, Peter who was so traditional. This was something impossible that was done by the Holy Spirit. In chapter 11, some Jewish disciples began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria. And there is born a first Gentile church, Church of Antioch. First Gentile church. There was something impossible that became possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Barnabas and Paul and with three other men and other people, the crew, went on their first evangelistic journey. And now we call that a mission trip. But this first journey really widened the scope of the gospel and the journey of the gospel. Up until the first missionary journey, the gospel has been primarily confined to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and a little bit of some, uh, Syria. But after this, it becomes so widespread, the gospel territory was 500 miles in radius. Now, those five men were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, and Paul. But by the end of the very first journey, the, these men were referred as Paul and his men. Now, you know from that phrase that Paul has rose to the leader of the uh, Christian church, leader of the early church. We always think that Paul was from the beginning the head, of, head leader, the most prominent leader. No, not so. Barnabas, Barnabas mentioned, mentored, and helped shape Paul from his conversion on. Our church is full of educators. We have retired educators, and, and we also have current active educators. What a great thing to witness and experience for your students to take off and fly and do way more than what you expected them to do. Now Barnabas is experiencing that after the first journey. Barnabas who mentored Paul sees Paul just taking off and becoming the very prominent leader of the early church. It's like, you know, I taught him. <laughs> you know, he was just converted on the road to Damascus, but now, 14 years later, he is the leader of the movement. That moment of pride, that moment of gratitude, I know you can identify with. In the first journey, I have mentioned that the leaders and preachers and pastors, even apostles, they were just human beings who make mistakes, who sin, who live by grace, just like you and me. You remember that time when Barnabas and Paul were mistaken as Greek gods? And their response was, we are mere mortals like you. Well, after the first journey, Paul and Barnabas. Paul, the disciple, and Barnabas, the mentor, got into a big fight. It was a bitter argument, the Bible tells us. What was the argument about? It's usually not a huge thing. It's about Barnabas' cousin, John Mark. You have read Acts with us all throughout the summer. John Mark, who came from a well-to-do family, went on the first journey with those five men 
And after Cyprus, he says, oh no, I'm dropping out. I can't make it. This is too much for me. And he drops out, drops out and goes back to Jerusalem. Now Paul held grudge against him and said, next time, I'm not going to take him. I can't take a deserter with me. So when Barnabas su suggested for the second journey, let's take John Mark with us, Paul was, hmm, no. You know that, hmm, no. We're not taking him with us. So it splits, the movement splits, but even in the midst of strife and negativity, God works what is impossible, possible. The movement, the mission trip doubled. It was 200% growth. First, there was one mission team. Now there are two mission teams. Barnabas goes with John Mark, and they're very effective. Paul picks Silas, and they go, and they become very effective. There are two teams now traveling to different places. And more people are exposed to the gospel. And more people are being saved in the name of Jesus. The second journey of Paul takes us over 3,000 miles. That's very hard for us to imagine. The first journey was only 1,500 miles, only 18 miles a day on foot. The second journey is over 3,000 miles. And the radius becomes doubled. They go to Antioch, Derby, Lystra, Phrygia, Galatia, Troas, Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, Caesarea. Over 3,000 miles. And it's all recorded in Acts chapter 15 through 18. It is a long journey. It's not an easy journey. It didn't happen over three months. It happened over three years. But during this journey, the churches began to grow and thrive, and the, they begin to see the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We always think when Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female, but all of you are one in Christ Jesus. We, we just, just read that and we just feel good about it. But it was such a radical statement back then. It was impossible for Jews to be like Greeks. Slaves to be like masters, and females to be like males. It was such a stratified society. They knew their place, and they didn't mix. For Paul to say this statement was such a radical. Sometimes it was so, so uh, blasphemous that he was stoned by people. Impossible stuff. But throughout the book of Acts, impossible things are made possible by the Spirit of God. And today, in our scripture lesson, that impossible thing is unraveling right before our eyes. Lydia, a woman. I want you to hear this. Lydia is not just a woman. He was, she was a Gentile. And she did not have a husband back in those days. Three strikes against her. Is converted, she is converted into Christianity. And she is taking care of this new church in the city of Philippi. In the first century AD, you know, 2,000 years later, we're still struggling with ordination of women. We're still struggling with free or, or, or slave. We're still struggling with Greek or Jew or Korean or Hispanic. 
But right there, the first century AD, the impossible is becoming possible in the name of Jesus. It says in Acts, Lydia becomes the person to have led and cared for the very first congregation in Philippi. I want you to hear, she didn't have the title pastor, but she was a pastor. Lydia's home was large enough, and she invites all those to gather and worship God. And when Timothy and Paul were traveling, she invites them in. And I give Paul the credit. He goes. He had many, many reasons to say, oh, I'm not going into a widow's home, a Gentile's home. But he goes in. And there, the first church, Christian church in Philippi, is established. There are so many things that are happening in the book of Acts. I want you to see it and hear it and read it and experience it in the power of God's Holy Spirit. How many of you had all kinds of challenges in your life and said, well, I'm not going to give in to those limiting words, limiting narr narratives. I'm going to be who I am, a beloved child of God. I remember my preaching professor, Leonard Sweet. He was talking about his mama. His mama was just a radical, wonderful, crazy lady. And they all attended a church of God. And one day she decided to wear red lipstick to church service. Church called her out spotlighted her and said, you are no longer a member of this congregation. I'm cleaning all this up, you know. Big, bitter argument. And Leonard Sweet's mother said, I am going out proudly and starting a new church. And she did. And from then on, women could wear lipstick. Well, I want you to take down your mask just for a minute. We have church with lipstick on. <laughs> How many times in your life somebody said, you can, you cannot. And you stood up with courage. Only God can give and say, watch me. I come from a long line of very conservative family traditions. And when I was about to become a minister, in fact, right before I joined uh, Candler School of Theology Seminary, all my family members and friends, well-meaning friends said, women couldn't be preachers. I didn't throw a fit, I didn't fight, there was no bitterness, I just said, watch me. I pray and pray this morning. There are so many limiting words. There's so many discouraging words. They all are trying to sway you one way or another. Stand on faith. Ask God for your guidance. As Paul did, Paul did not have a set itinerary. When he had a vision, he went to Macedonia. That's what Amy read this morning. Listen to God. Stay closely connected with God. And with courage, do what God calls you to do. That's what the book of Acts is all about. This morning, we had some arguments over <laughs> wearing masks and this. You know, my heart aches. It's all for you. And it's all for our brothers and sisters in Christ, in our community, and throughout our city, and throughout our nation. I want all of you to be well. 
I had COVID in January. It was no fun. I can't imagine you going through that. That's why I insist on masks. I pray that we can be doing good, doing no harm, and staying closely connected to God's word. Beautiful word, wonderful word, word of life. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.